Welcome back. We're on part three of our learning module for memory two. This one is on memory principles and let's dive in. We're going to talk about three memory principles. Now these are general principles about memory performance. They're not strong principles in the sense that they always describe how memory works. They're, let's call them usually the case principles. Uh, they describe that memory, perf sorry, let me say that, uh, based off of research in cognition, we often see that memory performance generally follows these principles. We're going to talk about the levels of processing principle. That's one. We'll talk about the Q dependent memory principle. I guess there's actually four here. And we'll talk about transfer inappropriate and transfer appropriate processing principle. Uh, there's one missing somewhere. Oh, the encoding specificity principle. All right, starting back with the levels of processing principle. Here it is. The strength and quality and depth of encoding will determine later memory performance. I'm referencing a paper from 1972 called Levels of Processing, a Framework for Memory Research. This was um, a highly influential paper. And these authors laid out, and they, they summarized a bunch of existing research up to that date. And they kind of pointed out something that in hindsight, seems almost obvious. Uh, when they looked at all the research that people were doing in human memory, they saw that memory performance tended to get better and better and better the more opportunities that people had to encode the information they were trying to remember. So the deeper you can encode some information, the more you can retain it on a longer term basis. They made a distinction between shallow encoding versus deep encoding. This is the basic idea. With shallow encoding, this could mean a lot of different things. It could mean you only had a little bit of time to encode some information. It could mean you had a low level of processing, maybe the way you process the information wasn't very meaningful. There might be less overall processing of a stimulus. All of these result in a weak memory trace. And on this idea, the, the kind of opposite of shallow encoding is deep encoding. And this can occur when you have more time to encode the information, when you do more elaborative or meaningful encoding of the information. This allows you to have more overall processing of the, of the thing you're trying to remember. And this can result in a stronger memory trace that will be around for a longer period of time. One of the examples we, we actually saw in an earlier part from the self-reference effect. This is a table showing us an example where people were given different kinds of encoding tasks intended to um, cause shallow to deep levels of encoding. For example, in a shallow encoding task, participants were whoops, shown words. They, these words were adjective words. And they were either presented in the same size font as the question or twice as large. So you're looking at a word, it's either small font or big font. And the task is to say if the words are big or small. Another version of the task was you'd see an adjective like happy, and you'd be shown another word like sappy, let's say. And your the question was, does this word rhyme with that word? So you have to look at the words and make a rhyming judgment. The second 
or the third uh, encoding task was you see a word like happy and then maybe you see another word like joyful and you're asked are do these have like similar semantic meanings so now you're evaluating semantic meaning of the words finally you could be shown a word like happy and the task now is to describe whether this adjective relates to you does it uh, uh, would would you say, um, and in the task, I think we can see that participants had to respond yes or no, whether the adjective describes them or not. The whole idea of this experiment was to cause people to do more shallow encoding. Like if you're just looking at the size of the letters, maybe you're not going to do a lot of elaboration on what that word is. Versus as we progress down these tasks, now you're looking at a word and you're trying to figure out if it describes you. Uh, that could result in much more meaningful kinds of encoding. And as we went through in the last part, if we look at memory performance, um, it gets better and better as the levels of encoding go deeper and deeper. So that's an example of the levels of encoding principle. It was, uh, do I have, no, I don't have a commentary on this, but one of, th this principle was criticized a little bit for being circular. And for example, anytime you find that people remember things really well, you could say that, well, they must have encoded it deeply, otherwise they wouldn't have remembered it well. So it, 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 has, it's not, th this idea is not without criticism, but it is also a general principle. And it's totally, it's not implausible or it, it also makes, makes a good deal of, of uh, sort of sense at face value. Okay, let's talk about cue dependent memory. The principle here is that context matters for encoding and retrieval. In general, cues in the environment can trigger memory retrieval for information previously paired or associated with the cue. In the last part, we talked about an example of divers learning words on land or underwater and being tested on land or underwater and so on. That's an example of context-dependent memory. This principle can be uh, clarified or also limited in a few different ways. And one of the ways in which the, the context-dependent memory principle is limited is in terms of what is called the encoding specificity principle. This is proposed by Endel Tulving. So I've got a quote here that you could read for this, but I've also got a briefer way to talk about it. So here's what the encoding specificity principle is all about. It says that the details of how information was encoded in the first place matters for later memory retrieval. If some target information was encoded in relation to its context, then contextual cues may be useful for retrieval later on. However, if the operations that occurred during encoding did not focus much on contextual information, then contextual cues may not be very useful as retrieval cues later on. One thing we can take away from this idea is that the environment that you're in, for example, isn't necessarily going to help or hurt your memory performance. If you uh, had made meaningful connections between the things you're learning and the environment that you're in, then that environment might become an important retrieval cue for you. If you don't make meaningful connections between what you're doing and the environment that you're in, 
then the environment's not necessarily going to be an effective retrieval queue for what you're doing. The last one we're going to talk about is called tip tap. This is short for transfer inappropriate processing versus transfer appropriate processing. So this is similar to the encoding specificity principle in some ways. The big idea here is how a person makes use of prior information encoded into memory depends on how the information was encoded in interaction with the demands of the present task. What does this mean? This is an important principle that qualifies the previous ones that we talked about. So for example, we talked about how memory can depend on how deeply you encode information. It can depend on the context that you're in. It can depend on how you relate the information to the context that you're in. All those things are general memory, memory principles. And at the end here, I'm saying, but memory performance will also depend on the nature of the processing required by the retrieval task. We're going to take a look at an example of this in a moment, but I'm going to preface the example with the concept that there can be a match or a mismatch between how you encoded something and how you try to remember it. So according to the tip tap principle, previous information becomes more available when retrieval processing conditions match well with the encoding processing conditions. And previous information becomes less available when the encoding conditions mismatch. I've summarized those two ideas in these bullet points. But let's see an example. So we're going to turn to a paper by Morris, Bransford, and Franks, and they demonstrated that the tasks performed at encoding and retrieval can influence memory performance. And I want to point out the title here, Levels of Processing versus Transfer Appropriate Processing. And if you look at the timing of this paper, it came out just after the Levels of Processing paper, and it also came out in the same journal. The idea behind this paper was to clarify that it's not necessarily how deeply you encode something. That's not the only thing that matters. You can encode something deeply, but fail to remember it if the retrieval test doesn't match well with the demands of the way that you encoded things deeply. Let's, let's um, see an example that could come across as kind of abstract. So we have an encoding phase here where participants encoded words in two conditions. One of the conditions, let's call it the semantic condition, participants saw words in sentences, and this was intended to encourage deep, deeper processing of the words because you're now looking at a word and you're thinking about its semantic meaning in the sentence. And that would uh, be contrasted with encoding in a rhyming condition. And here participants would see a word and they'd have to judge whether it rhymes with a different word. And this would encourage more shallow uh, phonet uh, phonetic processing of the word. So you'd expect that people would remember the words better if they saw them in a sentence compared to made a rhyming judgment about them. The twist here was they also manipulated what happened in the retrieval phase. And they gave participants two kinds of recognition tests. The purpose here was to 
change the processing demands during retrieval so that the retrieval demands matched or mismatched with the encoding, encoding task. There was a standard recognition memory oops, task. All that happened here was you hear a word and you said, oh, it was old. I heard that before. I know that word from before or new. So you, it's a very standard recognition memory test. Another version of the recognition test was a rhyming test. Now, in this case, participants would he hear a word, and this word wasn't shown during encoding, but the question was, did you hear a word that rhymed with this word during encoding? So this is a peculiar memory test, but and it focuses people on the rhyming aspect of the things they encoded. As a consideration, uh, let's think about what the levels of processing principle might predict for memory performance in this experiment. And I'll just point out that this principle suggests that the more deeply you encoded something, the more you'll remember it. So you should encode words and sentences at a semantic level more deeply than words that you were rhyming. So you should have better memory for the words and sentences compared to the words that you're rhyming with. And the format of the memory test shouldn't matter too much. But let's look at the results here. So this was a factorial design, and uh, we'll start looking at the standard memory task results. And what we see here is better memory for semantic encoding than rhyming encoding. Here we have the recognition test, whether people got the standard test or the rhyming test. And if we look at these two numbers, we see a 0.8 and a 0.6. So that's percent correct on the recognition test. Both of those two numbers are, um, oops, sorry. Mm, messed up a little bit. What we want to know um, is if we're looking at the standard memory test, we can see that people got 84%, correct? For words that they'd process semantically. And that would be pretty deep encoding compared to words that they rhymed with in the encoding phase. Those words only got 63% correct. So 84% correct when you encoded the words deeply, 63% correct when you encoded the words in a rhyming test. That's pretty standard evidence in favor of the concept of levels of processing influencing your memory. Let's take a look at the rhyming test though. So remember, this is slightly different. Um, now you're hearing a word and the question is not whether you heard the word before. The question is, did you remember uh, a word that rhymes with this word before? Okay. What I see here is 33% for, part, for words that were encoded in sentences, that's not very good. It's pretty low. And 48% uh, for words that were encoded in the rhyming condition. So notice something flips over here. Your memory for the words that you'd been rhyming with is now better when you're tested with a rhyming test compared to the words that you encoded in a sentence. 
And this is just some nice, short, and sweet evidence showing that there can be an interaction between the match, uh, but, sorry, there can be an interaction between how retrieval demands and encoding demands match or mismatch, uh, and how that influences memory. Ooh, that sentence didn't come out that great. Uh, my apologies. All right, so those are the three or four memory principles. I'll just quickly review them. We had the levels of processing principle. The more deeply you encode something, the more you're going to remember it. We, um, we have the queue dependent memory principle. That is just that context matters for encoding and retrieval. We have the encoding specificity principle. That is how you connect what you're doing to your context really matters. And finally, we have the uh, go transfer appropriate and inappropriate processing principle talks about the match between retrieval conditions and encoding conditions as being important for your memory. That's it for now. Make sure you take the quiz or complete any additional assignments for this learning module. And then next week, we're going to begin discussing implicit influences in cognition. See you then.